Taiwan um, affect the organization of the station. So engagement and attention is one of the big challenge um, for healthcare system. Uh, so treatment. So if you want to train, um, receive a treatment as well as training, or to convey a message to those like good healthcare practices. The first service game plays a, such an important role because it will help like every user and every partner to engage more forcefully and with much pleasure. So uh, let me invite on stage uh, Fabio Solari. What? Absolutely. Oh, uh, so for you to know, unfortunately, as Fabio uh, Solari uh, will not be there to this morning because uh, he's packed with his, uh, his blood, so he's in bed. Good morning. Today I talk about a pilot study for the assessment of social apathy through a serious game. Our aim is to develop a serious game for the early identification of social apathy. Since apathy can be an early neuropsychiatric symptoms of dementia. And then, what is important, it is to assess its feasibility and acceptance by both patient and the doctor. And to do it, we conducted a pilot study. Indeed, Dementia is an important issue for society. Indeed, it is considered a global public health priority. And serious games are appropriate as a new paradigm in cognitive evaluation. However, we have to pay attention on the real acceptability and the use of serious game in the clinical context. Indeed, the frequency of age-related disorder are increased due to the longer average lifetime and Indeed, Alzheimer's disease is the most prevalent cause of dementia. But what is important also is the pre-dementia stage, that is known as Mind Cognitive Impairment, MCI. And indeed, an early diagnosis of a cognitive impairment is essential to improve disease treatment and content. And for an early Diagnoses are important in new paradigm of cognitive evaluation. And indeed, a serious game can be a new screening tool that allows early, early people, patients in general, to do assessment avoiding the hospital context. The proposed uh, serious game was developed in the context of an international project between France and Italy, where doctors are required to game, where to implement a new idea to detect the social apathy, and they asked also to save locally the data, and we pay attention for security aspects. We have to pay attention both on the acceptance of doctors 
and the acceptance of fascists. From the point of view of the doctor, it is important to integrate the serious game in the traditional diagnostic protocols in order to be used in an easy, in an easy way during the activities. And also, it is important that the serious game provide a solid metric for the detection of diseases and in this uh, specific context of the couple. From the point of view of the patients, what is important is to develop an easy-to-use interface, since uh, most of the elderly people are not uh, able to use uh, in a simple way technologies. And the other important aspect is that we must design the serious game in a way that allows the patients to focus on the task, in order to allow the patients to identify with the situation where I play. We propose a serious game that allows patients to experience different social situations where they can decide whether to interact with other people and how much. The idea is to identify loss or diminished engagement in social interaction as a precursor of dementia. And the social interaction can be spontaneous social initiative with the people that the people do not belong to the family, or how in the relationship with the family member, or verbal interaction. We developed a tablet device, since this allows the use of a serious game out of the hospital and in different contexts, and this is important to reach uh, a large number of people, since it's important to detect the early dementia in a, in a large number of people. This is the scheme of the proposed solution. In the center, there is the user, in this case, the old people or in general the patients, that interact with the game in the town. There is a, a, a step where we allow the patients to identify with the different character of the game by choosing the avatar. Then we can also enter uh, patient code and other information. On the right, we can see how we developed the game. The graphics of the game we pay attention to these specific graphics and there is a part of the game where there is the narrative part where the serious game put the patient in the context. Then there is the dialogue part where there is the interaction between the patients and the people in the game. And then there are the choice of the patients on which we compute some metrics. The novelty of our approach is twofold. We designed a serious game for the early detection of mild cognitive impairment by exploiting the social interaction disorder. And then we developed the serious game by using a graphics and, uh, in general, the environment in order to allow the patients focus on the task and enjoy the, and enjoy the social situation. This is very important, the identification of the patient with the game stories, since uh, this allows them to behave as they do in real life, thus obtaining reliable game outcomes. 
we can develop the three different social interactions. The first one is an outdoor situation where the patient is a bus stop and they must start to interact with the people that who do not belong to the exam. And in another situation where a relative come in order to do some action together. And the third, where is simulated a phone call with a relative. We measure the patient's performance based on the degree of apathy detected by the choices that the patient makes. The pilot study was conducted by, by 10 participants and the doctor did a standard clinical assessment. Indeed, the seven participants had mild cognitive impairment, three had subjective cognitive decline, and the only one was apathetic. We used the self-report questionnaire to evaluate the experience and a score computed on the interaction performed by the patients in the game. This is the results about the setability questionnaire. And here we have a good result. Indeed, the patients are interested. There is interest, satisfaction, identification with the game. They have no discomfort, anxiety, and fatigue. So the acceptability of the game is good. Then, in this um, slide, I show you the variability among the patients and among the different games. And indeed, there is a, a lot of variability. So we have to pay attention when we design the different social interaction and how the patients identify with the different social interaction. We can notice that one patient indeed is different with respect to the other. The patient eight indeed is the apathetic patient, and they, the score is different with respect to the other. But since we have only 10 participants, this is not the only starting point. A good starting point when we need to assess better by involving more participants in this aspect. What is important instead is to look between the score of the serious game and the standard clinical apathy motivation index. Our results show us that there is a good correlation between game one and two with the clinical standard. And this is a good point. But the game situation three, the, there is no correlation. We studied this point and from a qualitative analysis based on the observation of the patients, we can see that this is due to the fact that the patients do not identify with the phone call. So, this is the last that is important to design very well the social interaction and allow the patient to identify with the situation in the game. We proposed an early detection of the social apathy through a serious game and we carried out a pilot study. The results are encouraging, are good, since the patients provide us a positive feedback and they are able to play with a serious game and the game score has a good correlation with the clinical method. Of course, we need to plan a study by considering more participants 
and you will need also to expand the different game situation by considering different storytelling and the kind of social interaction. And also it is important to consider also different graphical Thank you for your attention. Thank you to Fabio Solari for this big lesson to actually that like, like to have our presentation. And um, now I will invite on stage um, Ariana Uvilo from the Immersive Realities Lab in Rutgers, Wisconsin, for presenting Health School 2.0 Sexuality Education for a Narrative with Serious Game. I'm going to present a narrative series game that we developed for an ongoing project. I'm going to present the Headstroke 2.0, a narrative series game for uh, people with uh, intellectual disability. So, Headstroke is an existing project, it's a series of booklets that was uh, released in 2011. The booklets are currently reworked and digitalized because they are completely outdated. One big point is that they are uh, diversified. Um, they, will, they have been and will be used entirely in plain language to enable people to access these materials uh, alone. It's targeted towards uh, teenagers and young adults primarily, but also they are disabled. And uh, the idea was that because of this digitalization, that we could supplement the materials in the series game. I'm going to go into why we choose a narrative series game later on. First, I would like to give you a quick overview for uh, the story that came out in the process of this development. The premise is quite simple Alex likes to read. But Alex is uncertain. What those games mean, if it's friendship or love, and if, uh, if you uh, feel the same way, how can they approach you? There are many questions to be answered, and those points are actually all learning objectives of the booklet. So people are uh, viewing the story through the eyes of Alex, and they're finding out about these uh, learning objectives through the narrative of the game. Now, I spoke of diversity. Uh, for that matter, people can choose the gender of Alex and you. They can be male, female, or diverse. And to uh, allow for this, uh, this choice, we had to write the story entirely without gender pronouns, which was quite a challenge, but uh, it wasn't the only challenge. For starters, we had an extremely diverse target audience because Intellectual disability is a primarily a medical term this doesn't tell us much. So we have to go and look into how we can create a game that is suitable for the target audience. And um, there was little research on the topic to guide us. So we built on what little was there, but it also gave us an opportunity to gain new knowledge, hopefully. And lastly, it was extremely interdisciplinary. There were many disciplines involved, and not all of them familiar in serious games. Um, what do you see? Oh, you don't see anything. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Yeah, this uh, is a giant flowchart 
on the left that is by no means happy is uh, actually the narrative, the branching narrative. And this was the format that we found that uh, people in the team actually could reasonably read because formats like Twine that are easily readable are easily readable for game designers but not for uh, sexuality education experts. So including the different stakeholders was key to achieve the game that actually meets the goals. Um, for that we used the serious game design framework called Triad Game Design. It uh, proposes three worlds, play, meaning and reality, and those three worlds that form mm -hmm. the design space. Then each world has uh, experts that are primarily located in those uh, worlds. Um, from the world of play, we wanted to create a game that is driven by the choices of the player. Um, the educators in the form of meaning, they wanted to, to transfer the knowledge in an appropriate and correct way. And for the corner of reality, we had to write the story in a way that is relatable for the target audience. For example, um, it is totally realistic that the target audience uh, would visit a coffee shop with a friend, but things like large nightclubs are not accessible to them, so writing a story with a setting in a large nightclub would have meant that people miss our role because people see it and then would get discouraged or just not find it relatable. Now for the prototyping, since we had uh, no baseline to go with, we started at zero. And what we knew from a paper is that a narrative serious games might be suitable for the target audience because they are inherently slow paced, there is no time pressure. And it's also a genre where reflection uh, goes over action. A bachelor students uh, of the Fabrezzo developed uh, a serious game, uh, a narrative serious game, to find out if those assumptions actually hold true when uh, given to a target audience. And in a play test, uh, they found out that the short answer is yes, that works well. Uh, we did also notice that since choices are the primary interaction of the players, we really had to look into choices and how to make them interesting and how that would be beneficial in the means of transferring knowledge. And what we also knew is that the target audience frequently struggles in making uh, reflected choices because in their day-to-day -day life they often find themselves caretakers or parents making choices for them. So when they actually have to make the choice on their own, they often are uncertain how exactly to do that. To take this into account, we decided we only ever give two options per choice to limit, uh, limit this difficulty. And uh, we wanted to make sure that the choices we give them uh, have the potential to We thought uh, dilemmas would be a uh, good way to do that because it takes a lot of reflection, but we found that uh, dilemmas require you to remember a lot of information in order to properly compare your options. And uh, the target audience often has limited uh, attention scope, so they can't um, hold the same amount of information at once as uh, we can, so the dilemmas were really difficult it's simply too much information at once. Um, however, we did not get enough uh, credits to express the choices in the beginning, so choices like what, what shirt do you want to wear to the first day, but uh, that is uh, very much a choice that uh, prompted them to reflect because they didn't compare the options and the outcomes, so the, that kind of choice uh, fulfilled also this that we had in our choices. We then formulated these uh, choices uh, into a concept of meaningful choices and said that the, cho uh, 
choice is meaningful when it prompts people to reflect on and or when it has an effect on the outcome of the or on the, on the process of the story. We took all our learnings that we had from the first two prototypes and uh, called the uh, third and final prototype easy for it looking very much easy to live with but once again it is uh, that we had problems finding a software that would fulfill all our accessibility needs uh, so we ended up creating the software ourselves with Unity and Yarn Spinner and in the playtest that we conducted with a group of under target audience we found that the use uh, worked well they uh, reported enjoying it and everyone actually finished the game. However, we had uh, two students that the teachers had called us to struggle with making decisions and uh, they needed someone to sit with them and support them in the choice making process. They didn't make choices for them, but uh, we assumed that if they had been doing this alone and they would have faced these choices, they would have simply quit the game. So Assuming that the target audience will always be able to play this game alone, that is something we had to scratch from our requirements because it's simply not uh, realistic. The guidelines and the game are not completely finalized at this point. We have all the content, but it doesn't look finished yet, so we have to add uh, final artworks, uh, themes to like people and drawing those. And we are also currently looking into getting, getting voice actors to speak those different characters uh, because we are using text-to-speech software at the moment. It's not a huge issue because the target audience is used to this kind of voices, but it would uh, help qualitatively if actually people spoke the characters. In conclusion, we now have a set of preliminary guidelines to design Serious games for this target audience. Where, for example, we no longer have a time requirement how long people should take because uh, that varies greatly between individuals. But what we uh, found is useful is to say how many lines of text roughly should be in between uh, in choices so that people stay engaged with the game. It's also important to have a decompression in the end when we wrap up the game so that if people uh, did end up getting confused or struggle, they would go out of the game feeling sure and safe about uh, what has just been happening. We also found a participatory approach, mutual beneficial, so both people from the target audience and the subject matter experts were included every step on the way. And Without them, it would certainly not uh, come out the way it did. We would like to continue with the playtests because uh, we only have uh, around 70 people that we could test with due to the small size uh, of the classes. And we would also like to look into the play setting. So, I'm alone in the booth and playing in the classroom or outside of it. And lastly, we would like to create second prototype with those uh, guidelines to find out if they are really applicable to narrative series games in general. And with that, I'm uh, done. Thank you for your interest. And uh, I was happy to read the title of the next slide because that's happy part and uh, that's what that's for what we've done by the Thank you. Thank you, Adriana, for this great presentation. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Anybody? Okay, I, I have a few. Uh, sorry. Um, you were speaking about sexuality education, um, and there was like based on those leaflets that were uh, used beforehand. Um, did you compare, like, uh, the message we try to convey by the leaflet compared to what uh, your target audience 
you can form a plane uh, with a division? Have you tried already? No? Um, not in that manner. We have talked to them about uh, what they took from the game and tried to find out uh, what information they would claim. And they described concepts like boundaries and the difference between friendship and love. But we <coughs> did not look into actual um, if they learn something because we need much more participants and a long term study. Thanks. Um, any other question? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, join me for the week. We have a certificate to distribute. So, thank you for participating for the presentation. Thanks a lot. So, next. I will invite on stage Hua Bay from the University of Kof Bay, the School of Informatics in Sweden. So we will explain. She will present Happy Art, a game about healthy lifestyles for Nepalese teenagers. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Babai. I'm now studying in the University of Hangzhou in Sweden. And uh, my role is a graphic designer in a series game called Happy Hearts, which is a game about how to lifestyle for Nepalese teenagers. And today I would like to share the development experience and game with you. So I will begin with the luscious foods I tried in. Nepal, which is also my favorite food. Uh, it's called fried rice, or they also call it chow mein. Um, but unfortunately, as my Nepalese team uh, told me, it is a healthy food. Um, but it's really good. Um, so this also happened to many Nepalese kids and uh, their families. Um, cardiovascular disease increased due to those unhealthy foods in low and income, uh, low and mid-income countries. So this game came up. The overall aim of our project is to promote a healthy lifestyle through diet and physical activity to prevent future cardiovascular disease for Netflix teenagers. And also this project is a collaboration between Sweden and Nepal. Um, next I will um, introduce the, um, our, how we uh, develop our game. So initially we map out the detail of um, this knowledge gap by conducting um, study in Nepal by Netflix teams. Based on this report, uh, report we made a draft uh, for the design of the game. Then we created a, a paper prototype to be able to test it in Nepal. And at the same time, we did group study, um, try to capture Netflix food culture and habits. Uh, we also conduct uh, a study to understand Netflix teenagers' uh, visual uh, patterns and uh, also their graphic recognition. After that, we had a very clear picture of the uh, game map mechanics and the game graphics. Then we start to create the final digital game. While also we uh, conducting testing among colleagues and teenagers in Sweden and Nepal. So our game presents four main challenges in seven mini games. Mm, there are uh, identify and put, uh, categorizing food items based on nutrition. Um, preparing healthy meals, 
and planning a housing week plan calendar. So next I will show you some clips from our game. So this level is called Blue Salter. You can drop a, a drop, drag and drop um, fruit on the correct shelf, but you need to be aware that some fruit uh, uh, have no nutrition value, it should be uh, dropped from the same trash bins. Mm. So here in high water where you have beers or spirits is because it's, um, it's very easy for Netflix kids to get beer or spirits, it's also home to have alcohol. That's why we have this in this game. Uh, this level is called Sugar Rush. You can drag on the slide, slide uh, to guess the proportion of the sugar in each of the food items. And you will learn like, which item contains more sugar than others. Um, and, um, And you might see there, uh, if you get a wrong guess on the uh, proportion of sugar, it will have a like, green arrow to show you uh, like, where is the uh, right proportion. Okay, this level is called Monster Shelf. So uh, you will prepare five healthy meals for a day. Uh, you might wonder why it's five meals. It's because uh, it's next snap this uh, daily meal routine, so you will have five meals a day. And this level is the most difficult level, uh, even for adults. And this issue also happens in the game test. So we added this um, table of contents. Um, you can see in below is the little tables uh, to show the proportion of nutrition. And it's not just uh, for getting a higher score, uh, but also to get feedback in real time. Uh, if you still have some problem to get a higher score, like me, only, <laughs> only got two stars, um, you will see that you can check the journal on the top of the uh, right corner, and it will tell you what the housing flag should contain in this journal. And this page is of a benefit for all levels in order to get a deeper understanding of nutrition knowledge. Um, this level uh, is about to plan your physical activity for every day. And here you might wonder why we have reading, uh, gaming, uh, watching TV, a uh, play chess. A napping on our list is because napping students consider them as physical activity in class. That's why we include in this to let them know this is not physical activity. Um, so in conclusion, uh, we think that it's very important to napping to get knowledge about target food types to ensure that the corner, uh, the, uh, to ensure that the correct <coughs> approach uh, is applied and. From graphic design, because I'm a graphic designer for this game, I think the localizing feature is being image should take into uh, take into account players' pre existing visual appearance. Um, here is the example. Uh, this picture is what oh, you take when you do the food study in the hall. Uh, you will see that this is roti, which is Indian bread. It's a flat bread, and roti as a, a very uh, local food uh, was the most difficult object for students to identify during our food study in Nepal. So also roti is one of the most common foods in Netflix daily life, which might not be familiar in their daily media, such as books or games. Of course, and, and, and also in this part, uh, the effective visual communication is also my research interest. And thank you for listening, and we all come to see our game at demo rooms. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Your work is brilliant and nice. I
was wondering just if you have involved any kind of Norwegian museum that could help in this part, because I noticed that some of the games can be quite tricky, but if you have to define one specific food as just fat, it's very unlikely that you find a food that is 100% composition of fat. And how do we define what is healthy? The person decide, like, I'm very sedentary and now I'm deciding to run three times a day. How it can be like stimulating, it is more gambling behavior, more addictive behavior, rather than actually healthier behavior for each situation. If people were involved in creating a better diet of support or just by themselves, so we could have this kind of support before designing the game or doing the research. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the question, actually, it's a very good point. And we also consider about this part within our um, game development. And we have our, our Netflix team, they are, uh, our local, uh, their local team in Nepal. So they will give us the like, nutrition knowledge support for our games. But I'm sorry, I can't <laughs> answer more about because I'm a graphic designer. So thank you for your point. I, I get a shout out. So, uh, does the English language come as a barrier because it looks like a lot of the apps used to be for a Western audience and your target audience is to be very low income for Nepali kids too. Do you find that to be a challenge? Um, yeah, can, we, uh, thank you for the question. And we also consider this part. So, the first level of, of our game is uh, let them um, um, recognize all the foods. To match a uh, food with uh, English words, so I hope that level will help them to understand. And uh, and also this game is very heavily based on graphic, so uh, they don't need to um, read a lot of stuff. So I hope this will help them to play it and uh, also <coughs> learn the nutrition knowledge. Thank you. Thank you for this presentation. Awesome. <laughs> Very interesting and very beautiful also your energy. So let me give you this uh, certificate for the presentation. Yes, now I invite uh, Vincent Lele on uh, stage for presenting human emotion and learn the life-saving skill to gamification and VR. Yes. Good morning, everyone. My name is Vincent Lemaire. I'm very happy to be here with you this morning. And I would like to thank the GSGS committee to be part of this journey. I'm paramedic since 30 years with experience in medical emergencies. And I'm also a first head specialist instructor and the founder of VRSPR in Switzerland. I hope you will enjoy the presentation. Sorry.
share the same emotion with you. Okay? As you can see, you can witness a very difficult situation at first time. A victim is counting on you. Will you dare to come to the head? Every day, at any time and any place, you could be faced with an emergency situation for your neighbor right now, for your family, friends, or your colleague. Let me ask you this question. Would you be able to help under intense pressure and emotions. Thank you, Cécile. Um, Julien, est-ce que le traitement sur le slide euh, ne suffit pas pour vous faire gagner ici So sorry, I turn off my mic and then it was silent. You know, it will be alone. So that's a little bit for now. Doesn't matter, I will take. Would you be able and there? The key points speak for themselves. One person in two directly witness a cardiac arrest, but only four persons of people survive. How can we explain such a low result? Because of high levels of stress and emotions that are difficult to manage and prevent the application of emergency procedures. In addition, the lack of training and knowledge. And to finish, the more you practice, the more your stress decreases and the more self-confident you become. The low number of lives saved can also be explained by factors such as cultural or religious. For example, undressing and touching the victim. Cognitive lack of knowledge. Educational lack of awareness in school and other life. Social, fear of death. Self-esteem. We here we note the importance of self-esteem in managing emotions. Self-esteem, first of all, if it's too low and unstable, it will have a negative influence on self leading to rather negative interpretations. South. The contents of South directly conditions emotional feelings. The more negative the, um, the interpretation, the worse we feel. And last, emotions. These in turn reinforce the experience in the situation and therefore it is its interpretation and then low self-esteem, then makes vicious circle.
As you can see, our emotions play a major role in the decision-making process. If or when we control stress, we become able of rational action. For the rescue, our solution, we have five years of experience and a number of participants who have followed our first paid training model. We have seen a huge increase in awareness and self-confidence during the process thanks to the emotion in the air and the use of games in the non-game context. This increased audience participation, motivation and commitment as a part of an emotional training, intensive training course. Since it was founded in 2018, BRSQR raised awareness and trained 100 companies and around 3,000 people. We hope that this innovative approach will save lives. As you may know, during our first year of trainings, Gordon, on the right side, was trained to be a rescuer only during 15 minutes in VR. The next day, he saved a life, Francis, on the left. So, probably not only one life saved. So, I have this question for you. Will you be the next rescuer? Each other. So, see you soon in our training. But before concluding, I would also like to warmly thank to my team. Staff here present may I ask you to stand up, please. I have a part of my team, and the instructor, uh, and the others, were. So, I'm so glad and I would like to thank you for your excellent job. It's really important and together our actions made sense. Thank you for you, thank you for all. If you have any questions, don't hesitate. for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation. Any questions from the audience? <coughs> yeah. um, you said that uh, during training, people increase their self-esteem, for example. What do you really measure that? Um, it's one question for sure. Um, we can uh, measure um, with a specific uh, WFK system. It's only with uh, the feedback. Uh, after each training, we ask to people how was it, how was the emotions, how was the performance. Uh, of it, and uh, that's the first step. Uh, the next step is uh, one year or six months later when we, we see uh, uh, the, the guy, uh, the participants. We have um, his empiric, I know, I don't know if it's right in English. Um, we uh, take participants and uh, we place them in a pseudo situation. Uh, uh, fake uh, reality, and we try to do to, to see uh, what they uh, keep in mind from the last training, and um, we ask them how was the 
second train with this uh, exam. And people said, wow, I remember what I tried over one year. And I could uh, do the same. And about 60 to 70 percent people trained, um, keep in mind the first train, and then uh, are able to uh, do the same uh, procedure. Okay, thanks. But it's not uh, um, the same uh, way to a uh, uh, university uh, with a random. But uh, I hope you will do it uh, one day. Thanks. Any other question? kind of uh, training is, is uh, for all people. Then uh, with Virtua we will train uh, exploration exploration uh, in uh, industry company. Uh, that's uh, why we, we began uh, with this uh, with my company. But uh, if uh, any people are interested would you like to, to, to perform with our model? <coughs> Thank you very much. Let's have a Um, good and difficult questions to answer. Um, for com my company official, uh, it's uh, forces and uh, is the first victim with the first rescue of Gordon. But it's difficult because if there are others uh, life saved, um, it's a uh, use uh, often. Um, a taboo. Uh, people don't speak about uh, lives uh, saved uh, after. Then uh, we never know, uh, for instance, uh, whose life, how many lives were saved uh, with the rescuers trained by the rescuer. But, but I was uh, asking like, uh, like especially with this uh, device. Ah, with my, all, all my experience? Yes. Ah, okay. Wow. Uh, in 30 years uh, um, with paralytic emergencies, it's about uh, 10 to uh, 12 uh, um, hundred uh, lives taken by myself. How many are question. So you have, uh, um, uh, you can train people here, uh, so you can take it for, for that. And uh, do you need to be, be strong? Like, uh, and, uh, what do you think? Does it, uh, does it require something uh, specific? Because if, I, if I'm going to train, I don't want to myself, but uh, how do I just that training? Um, no required, no specific required, um, required uh, ask me. Um, the, the boys, the, the children can, can, can learn with this uh, training uh, uh, over 10 years. 
through 90 years. Uh, the, there's no age uh, or requires a specific to learn uh, how to save life. Every people can do it. Uh, and in this um, approach, this model, uh, is very, uh, with uh, the new technologies, uh, adapt for people, then it's really open for all. Thank you very much. Thank you.